Wonderful. All righty. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming this evening to our May speakers uh, pro pre presentation here for Western Cuyahoga Audubon. I think you'll really, really enjoy it. I know I've heard a little bit of it, and I'm just fascinated. I want to hear it all again. But uh, again, we just tried to start out with a little bit of fun and with our May bird quiz. So, you know, took a look at these questions. How many different species of common as well as rare gulls have been found in Ohio? Herring gulls are opportunistic feeders. What does that mean? That means you circle one. The red spot on the lower mandible of herring gulls is a target for the chicks to peck to stimulate the adults to regurgitate food. And I will tell you, one of our, our uh, people that, uh, that's on uh, in the audience um, suggested a slightly different answer to that one. And then number four, gulls living by the sea are sometimes called seagulls by lakes, lake gulls, parking lot gulls for those that are, that are around parking lots. But you know, what do you call a gull around living in bays, around bays? All righty. So here we are, Tuesday, May 3rd. I can't believe it's May and migration is really starting in. And I am Nancy Howell. I'm one of the board members with Western Cuyahoga Audubon. So again, welcome this evening. So here are the answers and we'll see how well you've done. So how many different species of common as well as rare gulls have been found in Ohio? Well, I had to look at the Ohio Ornithological Society's checklist and 21 species are listed. So that's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of rare, there's a number of rarities, but then there's ones that you see on the, on Lake Erie in the wintertime, especially, and, you know, the white-winged gulls and some of the black back greater and less, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, the great and lesser black back gulls. So um, yeah, 21 species. That's awesome. All right. Opportunistic feeders. What does that mean? Well, I think as all of you know, um, they are adaptable. They feed on a wide variety of food items and what, whatever is available. So it could be French fries, it could be fish, it could be going to the landfill, it could be pulling up earthworms out of the soil, whatever is available. Oh, the red spot on the lower mandible of herring gulls is a target for the chicks to peck to stimulate the adults to regurgitate food. I think I got this wrong. Uh, one of our participants said that red spot is uh, the ketchup from those French fries that they had. Not true. Uh, really, it is the, again, you can see that red spot on the lower mandible. I couldn't find a photo of one actually pecking, a uh, chick pecking that mandible area, but but isn't this a sweet photo? I mean, who would think that gulls are so, look it out, it's snuggled up, but you could see that chick would be pecking at that and then the adult would regurgitate. Well, could be French fries, it could be fish, could be whatever they're finding. Okay, so these gulls by the sea or a lake or a parking lot, but what do you call the gulls by bays? Bay gulls, of course. Ah, ha, ha. I know, so bad. Yes, this is like a second graders uh, joke, but hey, it's, it's all in good fun. Alrighty, I did want to mention our the spring bird walk series is still on and there's a couple more uh, May 8th and May 15th. They are at a wide variety of places, Cuyahoga, Geauga Lake, Medina and Lorain counties. Um, with Western Cuyahoga, we tend to uh, sponsor the Lake Isaac in the Big Creek Reservation, the Rocky River Nature Center. Uh, Hinkley Reservation and Station Road in Brecksville. So spring migrants and of course, birds that are there all the time could be, I don't know, mallards, Canada geese, that kind of stuff. But we want as many people to attend these spring bird walks as possible. They are awesome. All righty, Michelle, um, our board member and field trip co-coordinator. Michelle, take it away. 
Thank you, Nancy. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so I'm going to cover an upcoming special event, Vegas Day with David Lindo, as well as our bird walks, both virtual and in person, and how you can connect with us on social media. Next slide, please. All right, so David Lindo, the urban birder, is coming back to the US as a keynote speaker for the biggest week in American birding and has decided to visit us in Northeast Ohio, <clears throat> excuse me, for Biggest Day with David Lindo, a day of bird walks and other activities with David. So we will begin the day at 7.30 a.m. with a bird walk at the Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve and possibly other lakeshore hotspots. We will then have a members only lunch at Brew Dog, Cleveland Outpost and Scranton Flats. Registration is required for this event and is limited to 15 people. Uh, we continue at 5.30 p.m. with a bird walk at Beaver Marsh and then a members only dinner at Burntwood Tavern in Brexville. The meals or the seat at the table will cost $5 um, for your seat and then everyone is responsible for their own food and drink. Um, the $5 is just a, a donation to help us cover David's expenses while he's in town. All right, next slide, please. Um, Michelle, the, the walks are for anybody, right? Anybody. It only. is just the meals that mm -hmm. are members only, only because we have to limit to 15 people um, so we don't overwhelm the restaurant. But there are still seats left. So if you're interested in joining us for a meal and you're a member um, or you can become a member, uh, please um, go ahead and, and register. We have our links in the emails we send out every week. I think one was just sent out this today, this afternoon, um, or you can reach out to me and I can provide you that information. Thank you so much, Michelle. Sure. All right, uh, please join us the second Saturday of every month for our second Saturday bird walks. The next one is on May 14th at 9 a.m. at the Rocky River Nature Center. We meet between the upper and lower parking lots and then take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trails. Sorry. No problem. Um, Bill Dininger, Dave Grosskemper, and Ken Gober are our um, leaders for the walk. Last year in May, we saw nine warbler species, three vireo species, and four thrush species, as well as this American goldfinch pictured here. And next slide, please. Beautiful photos. Thank you. All right, this past second Saturday was held on April 9th, and here is Bill Dininger's report. He says, uh, the second Saturday of the month bird walk started on time with the temperature at 38 degrees and ended with temperatures at 39 degrees. There were a few scattered showers with brief rain early, and the walk ended with some sunshine. 17 observers spotted 36 species. The regular expected birds were present. Highlights include 15 golden crown kinglets scattered throughout the walk. Five brown creepers were seen by all. Two winter wrens were present. First of the year hermit thrush posed on a fallen tree trunk. A resident barred owl sat high up in a pine tree, visible for everyone to see. A red-tailed hawk was on an active nest and a red-breasted nuthatch came to the feeding station as we were review reviewing the bird checklist. So lots of great birds they saw last month, I'm sure. There will be plenty more great birds this month, so please join us. All right, next slide, please. All right, April's virtual field trip took place at Foreign Meadows in search of Kildeer, Wilson Snipe, and American Woodcock. The virtual meetup, during which I will present the scrapbook of everyone's photos, journaling, and bird lists, takes place the second Wednesday of the month, which means it is taking place on May 11th at 7 p.m. If you visited the location and have something to submit to me, please do so by this Friday so that I can get your items into the scrapbook. Even if you didn't have a chance to visit the reservation or park, meadow, whatever it is last month, you are still more than welcome to attend the Zoom meetup in which I will share the scrapbook for discussion. Please register at Eventbrite to get the link. Uh, if you're on our email list, you'll receive this link in our weekly emails. And uh, just as a reminder, this is our last virtual field trip. Our next slide, please. All right, we are starting up our early evening bird walks again in June. They will run the third Wednesday of every month through October. On June 15th, we will meet at 7 p.m. at Westlake Wetland and Evergreen Cemetery. On July 20th, we will meet at 7 p.m. at Fowles Marsh. And on August 17th, we will meet at 7 p.m. at West Creek Reservation. September and October walks will start at 6 p.m. to accommodate um, the, the lessening daylight that we have. All right, please stay tuned to our communications for those locations. And thank you to Nancy Howell for leading those walks again this season. Next slide, please. 
Uh, please join us the fourth Saturday of every month for the Tremont Towpath Trail Urban Bird Walks. That is a mouthful. <laughs> we are running these walks through October this year. We meet at the Cleveland Metro Parks parking lot on Abbey Avenue, just west of Sokolowski's University Inn. Uh, from there, your bird walk leaders, Nancy Howell and Al Brand, will guide you north through the Scranton Flats area of the towpath. The next walk is Saturday, May 28th at 9 o'clock a.m. So be sure to mark your calendar. Now this past tree mountain walk on April 23rd, the group saw a variety of gull species, including ring-billed herring, bonapartes, and lesser black-backed. The group also saw a killdeer, spotted sandpiper, belted kingfisher, peregrine falcon, and osprey. So that sounded like an incredible walk. I was sad to have missed it. All right, next slide, please. And finally, please stay connected with us in between our virtual and in-person activities by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Be sure to use hashtag WC Audubon when you post a bird photo on Instagram for a chance to be featured on our Instagram page. If selected, I will reach out to you with details. Also, many of our virtual programs are recorded like the speaker series meeting and our virtual field trips that I mentioned and can be found on our WC Audubon YouTube channel. So please be sure to subscribe. I believe that's it for me. That photo is a prize winner. That Thank is you. just like awesome. I was so excited that that was taken at Forey Meadows um, this past weekend. And I rounded a corner and I saw them sitting there and I was so thrilled that they stayed for a photo. <laughs> yeah, you know, if those flowers were in bloom, I don't think it would be oh. the same. But just seeing that mm -hmm. they were in bud, I just mm -hmm. that you need to enter that into a photo. Contest. Well, thank, thank you very you much. much. I appreciate that. Thank you. All righty. Um, our WCES book discussion, Drina Nemes has uh, run those this year and they have been fabulous. So Drina. Hello there, everybody. Yes, um, our themes this year were nonfiction and historical fiction, birding and conservation. And those books certainly uh, met those topics so very well. Next slide, please. These are the books that we read and I continue to highly recommend them. Where the World Ends was our historical fiction. Silent Spring is this uh, masterpiece and uh, really world-changing book by Rachel Carson. And then we had a lot of fun with the book, The Feather Thief, which is a true crime story. Next slide, please. Well, for next year, we will continue our quarterly meetings the fourth Tuesday of the month. And those are the dates uh, for 22 and 23, 2022 and 23. And um, I would like to again, thank the uh, Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society and everybody who participated, uh, especially for this, um, you know, the resources that we use to have these book discussions. Next slide, please. In case you're interested in keeping up with some other book clubs, Environment for the Americas has a monthly book club. They usually uh, feature the author of a book. And coming up next week, May 12th, is uh, Daniel Klein, who wrote the book Solid Air. And he's um, this is looking at how we can protect birds from um, running into buildings, especially windows. So there is the website for the um, book club for Environment of the Americas. It's, it's really quite excellent. Next slide, please. And then another fabulous is David Lindos. And he calls his, his meetings in conservation with he has wonderful conversations. And for those of us who read The Feather Thief recently, his most recent guest was one of the characters in The Feather Thief, Dr. Richard Prune. And he gave a marvelous presentation. I didn't discover it until it was, it was over. It was just on May 2nd, but it was in um, England. So um, I missed the time, the time zone but I started watching it and it's feather good, very good. And then um, David Lindo has fantastic guests. His season runs from April, from um, October through April. So it's over for this season, but there are three seasons worth of outstanding 
um, discussions and conservations and conversations. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks so much, Drina. Appreciate it a lot. It, th those books were terrific and uh, the discussions were wonderful. I hope we get a lot more folks and it'll be exciting to see what the 2022-23 selection of books will be. Yes. And here I am back again. And I just wanted to mention that uh, as a fundraiser with Western Cuyahoga Audubon, we are helping to sell tilt soil. Uh, earlier in our speaker series, we had uh, a person from Rust Belt Riders talk about uh, how they collect the food waste uh, around Cleveland. Some are residential, some are restaurants, and then create this marvelous soil uh, for people to use. And uh, I know I've purchased the grow, like you see there, a big bag of grow. And I also had some soil to start um, some new plants called sprout. Uh, so they have grow, they have sprout, they have a house plant uh, soil, and you can order those through our website uh, in the store and it can be delivered within the next uh, couple of days. So I send in the order and uh, pick it up and have it to your home. So again, it really just helps to keep a lot of food waste out of landfills and believe it or not, reduce some of the methane that is uh, created and in those landfills. So uh, we hope that you can uh, use it. It's, it's growing season now, so get that soil. We also have a few of our Mitchell's ice cream gift cards that are available. Again, still as a fundraiser for Western Cuyahoga Audubon. Um, they make ice cream, frozen yogurt, sorbet, and vegan ice cream, which is very good. The card denominations are $10, and you can order those through the, the uh, uh, Audubon store, and I can get those to you within a day or so if you live a little further away. Maybe I can mail them to you. I'm not sure if Amanda's on tonight. Amanda, are you here this evening? All right, I didn't think she was, um, but uh, she is our coffee coordinator and we uh, sell birds and beans coffee, um, which is a Smithsonian shade grown bird friendly coffee, 100% certified by the Smithsonian. Um, we are now beginning to take orders uh, for every th three months. Uh, we just sent in the April order and those were delivered already. The next order will be placed in July. Why are we doing this? Well, we were not getting enough um, uh, orders in to make the number of ounces that we needed to uh, have to have free shipping. So we're hoping that when people order, uh, give it a little bit more time every th three months, then we can uh, get enough orders in so that our shipping is free and that saves you and us a lot of money. So um, again, we wanna make this to be a fundraiser. It's really, really good coffee. Please go to the website and our homepage and see all the different varieties the different grinds that you can order, that type of thing. All righty. And this is one thing I really wanted to promote is next month's meeting is not on Zoom. We are meeting in person, hooray. We have been Zooming for a while. And I, I you know, our, our folks are very social. So we like to get together. So on Tuesday, June 7th, Beginning at six o'clock, this is one's a little earlier, we are having our WCES picnic. We'll have a bird walk and a plant exchange. Um, what we do is we ask people to come and bring your own dinner. It could be fast food. It could be something that you want to cook. We will have a grill um, started. And we're going to meet at the Lagoon Picnic Area Pavilion in the Rocky River Reservation. Um, Again, have your dinner, um, 
take a look at the plants that people bring. It could be bulbs, it could be leftover seed that you didn't get planted in your garden. It could be house plants, um, it could be it certainly plants that you may have a little excess of uh, from your yard. So it could be tomato plants, it could be some wildflowers or flowers that you've divided up. So we we really uh, I've oh I've come home with lots of nice plants from the exchange. So we hope that as many of our members and some guests can join us for the the uh, evening uh, in uh, Rocky River for our June picnic and plant exchange and bird walk. We will not have a meeting in July. In August, I know lots of folks like to, to take off and uh, we tended not to get very good attendance. Uh, we will start up our programming again in September. But this evening, we certainly do want to really welcome Bruce Buckingham with his presentation, the Lake Erie Herring Gull Project. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit of, about Bruce. Um, uh, Bruce Buckingham holds a uh, Bachelor of Science degree from Michigan State University, and he is now retired from the Ohio Division of Wildlife. He does uh, have a uh, master bird banding permit, and for 48 years he has been banding birds, about 48,000 birds banded of 128 species. He primarily now works with colonial nesting species, herring gulls, double-crested cormorants, great egrets, black ground night herons. And uh, Bruce does live in Port Clinton, Ohio. So welcome, Bruce. We really are so happy to have you here this evening. What I am going to do is I am going to stop sharing. I am going to give you, where are you, Bruce? There you are. Um, make you a co-host and then you should start being able to share Bruce share oh, your screen can you hear me that's the big thing yep. okay <clears throat> well let me uh and this is sort of new to me so bear with me uh let's see um Oops, got to get back on that one. I like, I like oops. Oops is all yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a hard time there, kidding it there. Um, thanks, Nancy, for the inviting me. I, uh, one of my passions is uh, banding herring gulls and doing research on them. Um, I'm not one of these presenters that will have um, all sorts of graphs and statistics and things that you need four or five PhDs to figure out. Um, so um, you'll probably hear me interject a few things about um, off the cuff type things. Um, this particular character here, uh, 1A5. Uh, Hold on. I call, I, you haven't shared your screen yet. I haven't seen it on your screen. Oh, Oh, Did okay. Let me try screen? again. Yep. Uh, my wife in here. Um, uh, let's this see. is Miss Technology. Yes. Yeah, this is my. Uh. Um, oh, shoot. Come on. Get in there. Okay. Hopefully, she is going to get. Good. It doesn't look like he's co-host on okay. my end. You I, I, just, I just reset oh, the co-host. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Um, okay. There's that. Can you see it now? Not yet. Oh, because you have to, we have to share. Okay. Let me get out of there. Oh, share screen. There we go. Uh, it's coming. Whoops. Now, do you see it? Yes. Oh, okay. Good. Thanks. <clears throat> this particular guy, as I said, is um, 1A5. I call him Cujo. 
Um, he is an extremely aggressive gull. Usually, um, you almost have to kick him off the nest to see what's going on underneath. Um, and this is a typical um, adult breeding gull. And a lot of times I get people that ask, what are gulls good for? Um, they're big, noisy, uh, they're quite messy. Uh, they're not quite as delicate and colorful as some of the warblers, but gull, herring gulls here in Ohio are a very valuable part of the ecosystem. Um, they eat just about everything. They are sort of the um, garbage collectors of the lake. Um, uh, like Nancy said, herring gulls are quite opportunists. They, um, they usually go after whatever's the easiest. Um, this is sort of the typical young herring gull that you'd see uh, that was hatched this spring, but um, you, this is what it would look like, say, in August or September. Uh, black bill, brown all over. And herring gulls, um, they will eat things that I would think most turkey vultures would probably um, just totally avoid. Um, and this um, uh, adult here, um, it's one, a type that you normally see in like the late winter. Uh, they, even though the head and neck are usually white in the winter time, they get this, uh, the speckles on them. And let's see. And gulls are also a good indication or indicator of heavy metals, pesticides, things like this. Um, this is sort of what got me going into the gull research. This is um, a young herring gull that had four legs. Um, two of them are normal and the other two are sort of um, partial legs. So if you wanna know how much pesticides are in the lake, you can um, do some stuff with the herring gulls. And it also, another one that I've been seeing lately, is a uh, cattle egret. So this is a young cattle egret um, being fed by the parents, but as you can see by the cross bill, once the parents stopped feeding it, it probably was not gonna survive. So birds are a good indicator of what our environment's like. And even though they're very valuable, uh, gulls can cause a few problems. Um, this, uh, herring gull here likes to sit on top of cars. Uh, this is over in the Jet Express parking lot in Portland. And I can guarantee you that the person who owns that car, when they come back from a, a day running around South Bass Island, is going to be a little bit ticked off. Um, and most of the control methods that people try don't work. Gulls are very um, uh, smart. They adapt. Um, as you can see by these greater black back gulls here, uh, these coyotes, they could care less. Um, they were probably afraid of them for about a day and then, you know, no more problem. And, oops. Um, one thing that you'll see a lot in the marinas are the uh, owl decoys. And again, this herring gull here is deathly afraid of that owl. Um, there's a famous picture, which I wish I could find, shows a plastic owl decoy with a herring gull incubating eggs right literally six inches away from the owl. So um, not too many controls work. And one of the biggest things with herring gulls is they have a attitude. Um, if you get too close to them, trying to pick them up, they will bite you and they don't just close the bill on you, they close and then twist. Uh, most of the scars in my hands are coming from these characters. Um, this is Cujo just before I uh, caught the bird and uh, put the bands on. 
um, you can get literally within about two feet of the nest and he just sits there and gives you a, a sort of a nasty look. Um, and big disclaimer on this one. This girl here is probably one of the best rehabbers in Ohio. And she knows how to handle any bird from a hummingbird to a bald eagle. And she knows how to handle it so that she doesn't get bit and it's the safest for the bird. Uh, she finally caved in to me just begging her to sort of let go of the head so I can get a, you know, the perfect picture. The minute she let go, bang, you know, the bird just started attacking her. Um, and there is um, a quite a difference in the plumage in herring gulls. Um, this is a, a one-year-old gull. Uh, they have two different uh, molts a year. Um, takes them about three years, and they're pretty much looking like an adult. Um, the only way we could tell that this was a one-year-old bird was because of the color band on it. Um, uh, young gulls especially are very hard to break down into the um, uh, particular species because so many of them look like. Um, and a few things about the herring gulls, they usually have three eggs um, in the nest. Sometimes they'll have four, sometimes two. And when the young hatch, um, uh, they're, they're wet, takes them about an hour or so to dry off. Uh, and then they'll um, start growing at quite a rapid rate, usually about 40, 45 days after they hatch, uh, they start uh, flying around. Um, we do get unusual things. Um, I'm not sure this, the scientific name of this, but that's a normal herring gall on the top. And the bottom one is a runt egg, as I call it. They never hatch. They seem to disappear pretty quick. Um, not really sure what's going on in here. And usually out of the three eggs in the nest, um, usually only about two will survive to the flying stage. Uh, like with most birds, they have a, a small hard end onto the bill, uh, the egg tooth, and they start breaking out. Uh, usually they are uh, not synchronized as far as hatching. Um, uh, about one egg a day, uh, they start incubating pretty much from day one. And in about a week, that's when things change. They're cute, fuzzy, um, critters, but um, they learn very quickly how to defend themselves. Um, they have a tendency to regurgitate food, um, which if I was a predator, I'd probably go after the, the, the food, and I guess that happens quite often. And they also realize that the tail end of the bird is a very effective deterrent. Um, they start um, depositing some nice warm whitewash on you all the time. But their biggest um, uh, defense that they learn is their voice. They will start screaming. And the minute they do that, every gull in the gull colony starts coming down trying to attack the predator, which in this case is me. Um, if in the, oh, if you go back about 20 years, most of the island uh, had just grass or small trees and you were exposed so the gulls would come down and you had to wear a hard hat. If you didn't, they would literally make a big um, cut on your forehead. And this is typical um, daily life in the gull colony. Um, the island is about 1,200 feet long, about 120 feet wide. And there's generally about 950 nests of the herring gulls out there. They're very territorial. Uh, the noise is extremely loud. 
And these trees have grown up and now we have um, about 1200 pairs of cormorants that nest above you. So it can get a little nasty out there. And by about four to five weeks, this is how they're looking. They're, um, they're beginning to try to learn how to fly. They'll jump up, flap their wings. They stay airborne for, oh, a foot or two, and then they fall back down. They're just building up their wing muscles. Um, and if you looked at this herring gull, even if you ask the experts, uh, what can you tell me about this bird? About all you can tell is that it's an adult. It's probably during the winter time because it's black on the on the, the neck and the head. So just seeing the birds are nice, but you can't get a lot of information from it. These two birds here, these this is a famous um, Windy Park uh, couple. Every winter, um, these two birds show up. The one on the left is called Big Daddy. He has a very large bill. It's quite thick. And the bird on the right is Lady Gull. And we can tell that because of the band on the leg. And trying to read these band numbers are pretty hard to do. But if you have a lot of patience, you can... Uh, read these numbers. Uh, these two come back same spot every winter, literally the same pier, same section uh, every winter. And this is what I use. The band on the lower left, that's the metal band. It has nine numbers that wrap around. It's almost like a social security number. No two birds will have the same number. And about the only way to get the information on this bird is unfortunately you have to have the bird in the hand usually, um, which means that usually the bird is injured or dead. But uh, if you have a good pair of binoculars or spotting scope, a lot of patients, you can read these numbers. I spent probably 20 minutes a day trying to identify the numbers on one bird, just couldn't do it. Um, the band on the right, OH5, that's a color band. And only one person in Canada or the United States will have a permit to put white bands with black number, letter, number in the whole country. That way, if someone sees OH5 and reports it, um, they figure out who has that permit and they can get the data from that. Uh, the band on the left weighs about one gram. The band on the right, the color band weighs about three. And a, a dime, your typical thin dime, weighs about two point, I think it's 2.6 grams. So doesn't really cause any problems. It's not heavier or anything like that. And this is what we'd like to have. Um, as you can see on the left, that color or the, the regular band, uh, you're not going to be able to read it very well. But the color band 6V1 is very easy to read. It's on three different sides of the band. And um, the nice thing about the color bands is most of the reports that you get are live birds that are flying around. Um, so you can get multiple sightings of these birds. And how do you catch these birds? Um, <clears throat> we use a very sophisticated, complicated trap if we want to get the adults. It's just a wire cage with a board and it has a um, hinge on it. And there's a string that goes from the hinge to the other side of the the cage, and you just put this over the nest. Um, you put it on, usually within about three minutes, the incubating bird comes back, tries to, to get onto the nest, trips this little string, and the cage goes down. And what you get is this thing, 
um, bird just sits there, usually continues incubating until you come on over. Then you have the fun job of trying to reach in there and grab this bird without getting bit. Um, and once you get the bird, at least with the adults, uh, to uh, get the sex of the bird, we take the measurement from the back of the skull to the front of the beak, and then the height of the beak itself. Put in a complicated formula and pressure change, so you can tell whether it's a male or female. This gets a little bit dangerous in here. But this is the way that I do most of my bidding. Um, you wait till about four weeks old. They run around pretty good, but we just use a landing net uh, to catch them. And usually if, if you have to take more than about three steps, you don't even go after them. Um, at this point, their legs are as big as they're ever going to get. Works out pretty good. Uh, there are some complications. Um, as I said, the birds like to regurgitate and get whitewash all over you. But you also have the birds, uh, the cormorants above you, they're regurgitating fish. And in this case, this person, she first gets hit in the forehead, dribbles down on her shoulders and down on her elbows. Um, not a pleasant sight. And if you're unlucky, you'll get hit with a half regurgitated uh, white bass or a perch. Um, cormorants are uh, quite no notorious for this. And we also do some rooftop nesting um, banding. When the gulls are nesting on the roof, which are gulls are finding out that it's safer to nest on the roof, their first flights usually about a 45 degree angle down to the ground. And um, early in the morning here in Portland, I'll ride around on my bicycle trying to catch these uh, young gulls. Um, their uh, parents are quite territorial, so you do get into some nasty situations. And this is the ideal thing. Um, the birds are capable of flight. Um, they stay relatively close to where they were hatched, uh, literally like within oh, 40, 50 feet. Parents will keep on feeding them, but eventually, once they really learn how to fly, they'll gather in these groups of juveniles uh, down on a beach or a river. Um, and then the parents will keep on feeding them for, yeah, about two to three weeks. After that, they're on their own. And for the next two or three years, uh, they're traveling all over uh, the Great Lakes. And this is my only, only statistics. Um, I've been banning the gulls since 1981. So I've got a little bit over 29,000 that I've banded. Um, the color banding started in 2015. I got a little over a thousand. And you get a lot of reports. Um, uh, it's, it's definitely pretty good. The normal bands, you only get about a one or 2% recovery rate. And I've had about 1,200 um, different reports from this. And from this, we've learned that only about 51% um, of the young that are raised at a colony or a rooftop come back to breed in about four years. The other 49% traveled uh, to other colonies. Uh, we had three over in the uh, uh, Gary, Indiana area, three up in Detroit, three in Port Clinton. Actually, that's wrong. I've got, I just saw another two today um, that started breeding over here. Uh, Cleveland should have a higher number because there's a lot of rooftop nesters over there. And uh, it just, people don't 
get close enough to see them. But then also Toronto and um, um, the Buffalo area. And life is not easy for these juveniles. Once the parents stop feeding them, they're on their own. They have to learn how to avoid predators, what things to avoid like power lines, cars, things like that. Um, so as with most birds, it's not, um, it's not an easy task. This one was found way up in the interior in Ontario. And from talking to the person who had found the band, there's all sorts of eagles and peregrine falcons in that area. And both eagles and falcons will go after these birds. Um, unfortunately, it's just sort of a fact of life. And this is about the last of my um, bad slides. Um, in Lake Erie, unfortunately, uh, fishing line and fishing lures are a problem. Um, they get hooked, and if they're lucky, someone finds them uh, before they're too far gone, takes them to a, a rehab center uh, like the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, um, and they can get recovered and be released back into the wild. Even for the adults, there's some problems. Um, this is Stumpy. Um, the right leg had uh, apparently a fishing line injury. Uh, so the webbing on the foot's missing. The left leg, um, a lot of the webbing was missing. So I don't know whether uh, something had gone to it or maybe it got into some chemicals or something, but. Um, this was back in 2017 that I banded Stumpy, and every year Steve keeps on coming back, same general spot. And this is where John Doe Public comes in. It's the bird watchers, the boaters, um, the citizen scientists that they'll see a bird with a color band. And if they report it, and there's only about 20% of the people ever, that find a band ever report it, um, and I hate to say it, probably the worst people for not reporting are wildlife people, state agencies, uh, federal government ones. Uh, but if you just go onto your computer and type in reportband.gov, takes about three to four minutes to fill out the form. And what happens is you get this nice fancy certificate of appreciation, tells you when the bird was banded, who banded, um, the age, the sex of the bird. Um, so gives you an idea of where these birds are coming from. The bander uh, also gets a report, usually it's every Saturday, we'll get a report, computer printout of everything on any birds that have been reported. And that comes in very handy. Um, from 1981 to uh, 2000, that'll be 2014, I was just putting on just the regular bands. And this is a Google Earth map that shows where some of these birds have gone. Um, we had one down in Cuba, was found dead in a soccer field. Um, we've had some in Nebraska, Nova Scotia, Florida, um, and the Texas Gulf Coast. Um, it's a little deceiving on this because you have to zoom in. This is probably about 800 different sightings here. And the colors um, on the numbers, that's the time of the year. Uh, the blue ones are right now, um, March, April, May. Uh, red ones are June, July, August. Uh, let's see, the green ones are the fall season and the oranges in the winter. Um, and some people always 
will ask me, what's the farthest distance you've ever had one? Uh, just got this bird last week. Um, it was banded in June of last year. And about four or five months later, it's down right on the Rio Grande, uh, 1,300 miles away. Um, I would have loved to have had a rail transmitter to see how the bird got there because it won't go on a straight line. And from this banding, uh, during the winter time, about half of the birds, the young birds, will stay up in that red box, Lake Erie, Ontario, Huron. But about a quarter of them will go from New York City to uh, Chesapeake Bay, and another quarter will go down um, along like Corpus Christi, um, New Orleans, like that. And this is where the banding comes in important because this is data from 81 to 2014. And you can definitely see there's a, a pattern here. These are the color band report spots. Um, except for that last bird down in Texas, we haven't, we've only actually only had the one bird down the, the Gulf area. Um, very few birds open in, in the New York to Chesapeake Bay area. Most of them have been staying up in Lake Erie. Um, we're getting a lot of birds that are moving up into um, the interior of Ontario. Uh, during the fall, you expect a migrant to go south, but a lot of these young birds go north. Um, and it's strictly through the um, uh, color banding. Out of the, uh, let's see, it's just a little over a thousand that have been banded. Um, I've only had 26 that have been found dead. Um, the vast majority of the reports that I get are live birds flying around, um, which comes in quite handy. And this is what we'd like to get. It's multiple sightings. This bird was banded over in Sandusky in June. Does the reverse migration up north of Toronto into one of the interior lakes and stays up there for a good part of the winter, but then the ice start freezing the water. Bird migrates for about a month or so down to southern Indiana. Uh, this bird here has since been seen over here in Port Clinton. It's almost to the age that it might start banding or uh, start breeding. Uh, so it's this is what I go for on this. Um, and these are some of the uh, Lake Erie here in Ontario sightings. And it's a little deceiving. Uh, because if you look over, um, it's where Sandusky Bay and Port Clinton would be with a, um, the Google Earth, if you zoomed into that area there, you get these big clusters. Um, this is a parking lot that the birds like to spend the night in. And um, it's not totally up to date because I myself have seen about 110 of my birds into this area. It's mostly non-breeding birds. So that last, uh, let's see if I go back. Right here, it looks like there's only one or two birds over in Portland, but definitely a lot more. And... These are young birds from 2015 and 16. They sort of stayed in Lake Erie. Uh, did have one bird that went over to the normal spot in Chesapeake Bay in New York. One bird's been spending the winter and summertime down South Central Ohio. Uh, he's there uh, pretty much all the time now. And there's a big difference between the young birds and the adults. These are the sightings of the adult birds 
I banded 100 in 2017 and another 100 in 2018. And they pretty much just stay right here on the south shore of Lake Erie. Uh, Cleveland area gets quite a few of them. Um, Lorraine, um, Vermilion will get these birds. And it's, it's strictly through people like yourself that would see a color banded bird and report it. If I see a flock of say a hundred gulls, I usually just do a quick scan of their legs for any color band birds. And then I'll go right back looking for any rarities. You know, you, it's just not all herring gulls or ring bills. Sometimes you'll get some of these odd birds, uh, California gull or something like that. And then in 2018, and this is where I'm gonna to have to take a look at the weather conditions in the winter. We started having some of the birds go back south. Um, just one Florida, uh, one bird was seen about a month apart uh, down in the Mississippi area. But again, most of these birds since 2015 are spending their time on Lake Erie. And then 2019, Again, we have all these birds moving north. Um, some of the birds, um, uh, like the one on the right, 5K7, um, they like to follow some of the rivers uh, as they go down to uh, New York City and like that. So sometimes you'll get some reports there. And then 2020, again, the same thing. Birds are staying um, here in the Great Lakes. Um, and a lot of them are doing the reverse migration, going north into the interior of Canada. And 2021 was an odd year. Um, we had one bird within about a month or two went from Sandusky over to um, the Gary, Indiana area, real close to where these other birds, these adults have been found. Then uh, I think it was like two months after banning, we had one bird that was found on uh, Desert Rock, or yeah, Desert Rock Island, 18 miles out into uh, the Atlantic Ocean up in Maine, just, flew up there super quick. And then of course we had the one bird um, that, let's see if I can change it, um, decide to go on down to Texas. So they move around quite a bit. Um, again, it's the, the average person that uh, looks at a flock of gulls and takes the time to just take a look, see if they can see any of these color bands. Uh, they'll see it, report it. Uh, usually within about a day or two, you get the information back and then the bander gets the stuff. And any questions from anybody? There is a question, there is a question in the chat um, are there any reports of Big Daddy or Lady Gull in other locations besides Wendy Park? No, that's the thing that I'm trying to find out. Um, the one person that gets to see these birds on a regular basis in the winter, um, I think it's probably been the last five or five, six years, he's been seeing these two. Um, we don't know for sure if they're breeding in the Cleveland area and just go down, you know, for like rooftop nest, go down to Windy Park in the winter, or it could be one of my Sandusky birds um, that um, some of the adults that nest here in Sandusky do go to the Cleveland area in the winter. So unfortunately, 
uh, we don't know for sure. He, uh, these bird, Lady Gull has never been seen any place except for Cleveland. Hmm. Uh, any other other questions? You can unmute and ask a question. Um, Bruce, you might want to stop your share and then we can see hopefully everybody. Yeah. It will uh, pop up. Stop share. Okay. There you go. I don't see any little hands up. So again, any question? I guess I have a question. What's the name of the island that the cormorants and gulls were nesting? I, I don't it's know if I missed it. Sandusky Bay Turning Point. Okay. Um, it's down near the Shelby Street boat ramp, right by the coal docks. Um, if you go back to 1977, uh, there was only a few trees out there and they were only oh, six to eight feet tall. But they, uh, as usual, the gulls have adapted people pretty well and they just, um, they don't mind all the boaters and fishermen going by. So the cormorants haven't killed off the trees with their um, The cormorants have hit the trees pretty hard. Um, they're not as thick out there as in the past, but um, <coughs> um, no, they haven't quite killed them off yet. Other spots, um, they have killed the trees because of the excess nitrogen in the droppings, and they do have a tendency to strip the leaves for their nest. I think, Paul, you had a question? Uh, yes. Um, do you or do Paula. any baking? Yeah, Paula, thanks. <laughs> do you do My eyes do aren't going. That's okay. Do you do any banding on the rooftops? Um, generally speaking, I don't do any on the roof itself because uh, you to put the color bands on, you have to wait till they're just about ready to fly. <coughs> and uh, most of these roofs, at least in this area, are not the best. And um, uh, one person I know was doing some research work in Sandusky and fell through a skylight that wasn't wasn't around he couldn't see it wow so I, <coughs> I just wait for the <coughs> i just wait for the birds to come on down to the ground uh. so should we see a gull uh with bands um you want and the report banned is that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service band that's reported, or the color band, or both. It can be either one. Um, the color band and the uh, <coughs> the regular band. That's the U.S. Geological Survey band. Uh, but in the reportband.gov, there's a spot for either a color band or the uh, metal band. Or you can just contact me. Um, actually, Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, uh, some of those people help me out in the banding. Yeah, Tim Jasinski <clears throat> loves his gulls. Oh, yes. <laughs> I have a uh, question. Yeah. Um, yes, it seems like gulls can really tolerate a lot of cold. And do most of them migrate or hang around or? I would say it over half of the birds stay in Lake Erie. Uh, but as the lake starts to freeze, they start congregating in places like the Cuyahoga River, um, the Vermilion River, Black River. Um, it's sort of like with the waterfowl. If they don't have open water, they can't find food. So they'll just 
gathering these areas. So, but on a typical year, most will spend the time either in Ontario or uh, uh, Lake Erie. Thank you. A uh, question came in, any guess as to why some of them go north in the winter? Um, usually when they're migrating north, it's the young ones and it's primarily um, ones that were hatched that year. A uh, two-year-old gull or three-year-old gull generally doesn't migrate north. Uh, not sure why they do it. They're just going into these uh, small interior lakes. Um, uh, the people that see them are generally year-round residents in these spots. But once those interior lakes freeze, then they move on back down. Um, and like you were saying, um, Nancy, about the birds being opportunists, uh, I've had a fair number of reports from commercial fishermen where the gulls will land on their boats begging for handouts. And then all of a sudden, here's a bird with a color band five feet away, and they can get the numbers pretty easy that way. Interesting. Well, I thought, I, I thought this was fascinating. You know, a lot of people dislike gulls. I like looking at them. I mean, their numbers and they're just, they're just wonderful. Um, you know, we have those pelagic trips on Lake Erie where people bundle up and go out on New Year's Day and look for gulls and rare things out there. And, you know, it's just like, uh, are you crazy? No, it's fun. <laughs> Now, with the herring gulls, if you take the national population, it's been dropping down uh, about five to eight percent a year, especially on the East Coast. Uh, we're not quite sure what is causing this problem, but uh, uh, they do adapt to people. And the, the ring-billed gull population increasing? <clears throat> Yeah, the ring bills have been increasing. Um, one researcher up in Duluth, Minnesota, has been doing quite a bit of work with the avian influenza, and she bans a lot of ring bills up in Duluth every year. And originally, most of these birds would migrate down to the Gulf Coast, down to Florida, Georgia for the winter. But she's been noticing in the last two or three years, these birds are staying or going uh, not as far south for the winter. She's getting less birds in Florida, but more um, Tennessee, Kentucky. So is this global warming or what? We're not sure yet. Yeah, I think matching up the the lake freezing and the data that you have, the weather conditions will, will tell you a lot about, you know, what's happening, you know, why the gulls are moving where they are. So, but we got the open waters, you know, it used to be the, the uh, warm waters from, coming from the electric power plants. And now it's mostly rivers. Uh, that's where the gulls are hanging out. And also in the wintertime, that's when you have a lot of the uh, bait fish, the shad and things like that that are coming in. Um, it's a little hard to see individual gulls if you have five, 6,000 gulls following a uh, large boat coming into uh, like the Cuyahoga River. Uh, they're just flying around so much, it's just really, really hard to, you know, see an individual goal. A uh, question came in about uh, egrets, herons, and gulls nesting on um, a, a, an island around Sandusky. Um, yeah. So That's how long, yeah, how long uh, did you say that they've been nesting there? <coughs> If that's uh, that's the, the turning point, 
And originally back in the late 70s, it was just uh, herring gulls that nested. Um, when I start going out in the early 80s, we had black crown night herons and um, <clears throat> cattle egrets uh, nesting out there. Uh, uh, 1999, the cormorants started nesting. We had 25 nests that year. And about the same time, that's when we start seeing um, a lot more of the great egrets uh, going out there, when we do the sur nesting surveys, there's usually about 200 pairs of great egrets nesting out there. And we'll occasionally see a snowy egret out there. Uh, and also, a um, we've had yellow crown, yellow crown night herons out there during the peak of the breeding season, but we've never been able to actually find the nest. So, we can't really officially say that they're nesting out there. So that's different from West Sister Island? Yeah, West Sister is about 10 miles north of McGee Marsh. Um, and that has a, a huge population of the herons and egrets. Um, um, let's see, Green Island has had cormorants nesting on them but it's actually affecting the uh, vegetation out there. Um, uh, I know that there, well, there used to be a, a big heron rookery on Route 2, just south of Sandusky, but the high waters uh, killed out most of the trees and the herons left. But the turning point, that's definitely a, a good spot for all sorts of uh, herons and egrets. Nice. All righty. Well, I think that this has been a fabulous evening. Thank you, everybody, for there's been some very nice comments in the chat. You know, thank you, thank you, thank you. But <clears throat> very informative. Hopefully, I'll get a chance to maybe send in some of those band uh, numbers and help you out a little bit. I think uh, a lot of us would yeah. like to do that. Yeah, the more reports we get, the better, because um, the more data you get, the more accurate the, the research is. Fabulous. Well, everybody have a good evening. Thank you so much, Bruce. This was fabulous. And uh, keep up the good work. <laughs> <laughs> well, appreciate it. And everyone have fun with all these warblers and thrushes and vireos that are moving through here. Uh, I just look out my backyard. I'm typical, um, what do you call it? Inner city yard or small town yard. And every so often you look out there and all of a sudden here goes a black throat blue warbler huh. you know, out in the evergreens. And it's all, you never know for sure what you'll see. Yep. All righty. Everyone have a great evening. Thank you for coming. Happy spring, everyone. <laughs> Thank you.